It's now time for the finale to the Yu-Gi-Oh! series as this series of videos went through the Generation 1 era of Yu-Gi-Oh! So essentially anything that deals with Yugi Moto along with his friends on their adventures. This trip down memory lane is filled with a lot of great times flooding back in after so long from my obsession with all things Yu-Gi-Oh! growing up, and I hope for you it can provide that as well. Today we are continuing our journey through the world of Yu-Gi-Oh! where last time we looked into the fourth season of the series, which had the focus on a group called Doma, ran by an ancient powerful leader named Darts, using the power of the Orichalcos to bring forth an ancient god. For the fifth and final season of the technical first generation of Yu-Gi-Oh!, it's time to finally take a deep dive into the Pharaoh's past and learn about so many unanswered questions, and maybe a few other things on the way before we get there. We are also going to talk about two more Yu-Gi-Oh! movies, as the first one we'll talk about today kind of blends three generations of main protagonists from Yu-Gi-Oh! together, and the other movie acts as a final epilogue for our characters for one last adventure. Each part in the series can be viewed standalone alone and also viewed as one big series. But with that said, welcome to the puzzling world of Yu-Gi-Oh! Part 5. Before we get to start digging into the Pharaoh's past, there's another small arc labeled the KC Grand Championship. This arc is also not so loved, but there is still some good stuff here. Right now, all of the characters are still in the US, as this isn't long after the end of the previous season. They're all kind of stranded in the US, having no money to afford plane tickets back home, but Mokuba shows up offering a free ride back as long as they agree to take part in the KC Grand Prix, a tournament for the best duelists around to celebrate the opening of Kaiba Land. Yugi, Joey, and even Rebecca all sign up to take part in it. Meanwhile, some new villain named Siegfried gets alerted to the competition and plans something devious for it. Joey was hoping that Mai would be there for the tournament as well, but gets down in the dumps when Mokuba tells him that they haven't been able to reach her in regards to joining even though they want her in it and have tried. When they arrive at Kaiba Land, they see these new battle terminals that have data from a bunch of different duelists in them to offer a real challenge for those who want to face off in a game against a computer. But as everything is getting set up for the tournament, Siegfried hacks into the systems and locks everyone inside of the battle area, as Kaiba is pretty pissed about this and is gonna go after whoever is behind it. But Yugi faces the challenge of dueling the computer to free everyone, so no biggie. The next day, the tournament is about to begin with 16 duelists entering in, and the winner of this will go and face off against Yugi as he is labeled the Duel King, or King of Duels, or Dude Who Be Duelin' Dopely. Joey is up for one of the first duels against a mysterious masked man whose name looks hard to pronounce, but his first name and his last name are just spelled backwards, as it would correctly spell Grandpa. Moto. I mean, it looks just like Yugi's grandpa, but no one could tell. Joey is determined to see the duelist's true identity. I mean, come on, Joey, you're smarter than this. I hope. There's more duels and more action when Yu-Gi-Oh! returns. And now, back to Yu-Gi-Oh! They start their duel as Yugi is excited to see how this match will go, as he kind of figured out and was informed by Professor Hawkins that this is his grandpa joining in to get back in the game after growing bored of just working at the shop. As their duel goes on, the results of another duel between the characters of Leon and Richard has come to the result of Leon winning, as we see Joey and Yugi's grandpa still going at it, but in the end, Joey just barely scrapes by with a win here. Next up, Rebecca gets to duel some more as she now goes up against Vivian Wong, and despite a solid game from Vivian, Rebecca Rebecca ends up winning, while another match between the characters of Paul and Shane happens, and the winner turns out to be Paul. Now we get to see Siegfried duel against someone, who would have been Fortune Salim, but earlier Rex and Weevil are back, and they end up taking him out and disguising themselves as him, but not for long, as they trip and fall, exposing who they are, and get questioned by Mokuba about what happened to the real duelist, and Siegfried allows them to still battle against them, even if they aren't really registered in the tournament, and he gets the win regardless, he's just a showman. And like, one turn flat, Siegfried Siegfried destroys both of them instantly, as this display of power worries the others about how powerful this character is. Now that it gets down to eight people, there will be four duels. Ethan versus Leon, Rebecca versus Abe the Monkey Boy, Paul versus Balfrey, and Joey versus Siegfried, as they will all happen at once. While Joey puts up one heck of a fight against Siegfried, and at least not losing on turn one, Joey ultimately loses the duel, with Balfrey, Rebecca, and Leon winning theirs. As we get into the next set of duels for the semifinals, it's Siegfried facing Balfrey, while Rebecca faces Leon. As Rebecca's duel still goes on, Siegfried ends up winning his and moving on to the 
the finals. Rebecca, however, ends up losing the duel, sending Leon to the finals to face off against Siegfried. Outside of this, Yugi gets himself in a weird situation where Vivian offers him a friendly non-competition duel, where if Yugi wins, she'll help Yugi's grandpa's back. But if she wins, then Yugi has to go on a date with her? Uh, no time for love though, as Yugi defeats her pretty easily. But now it's time for the final duel, with the winner getting to face Yugi. But Kaiba shows up to the arena, and tried to disqualify Siegfried for entering with a slightly false name. But to prove himself, Kaiba challenges him to a duel. Sorry Leon, guess you're not so important right now, for whatever reason. I'm sure you will be, because spoiler alert, you're, you are the younger brother of Siegfried. Kaiba and Siegfried go at it in a duel, and thanks to his trusty combos, with his blue eyes white dragons, Kaiba is able to eventually defeat Siegfried. Siegfried still has some sinister plans afoot based on losing, as he has a secret field spell card that seems like it could be menacing. For the final show, it's Leon's turn to duel, going up against Yugi for technically winning the tournament. This battle will be broadcast all around the world, and Leon was given the secret field spell card from his brother before going out to duel. Mai even ends up looking up at a screen broadcasting it from wherever she is gone. And during the duel with Yugi, something seems a bit off with Leon, based on who he is been throughout the tournament up until this part. Siegfried comes to spoil the fun about his plans being executed as Leon is forced to do whatever he is told, as this is part of an obligation to his brother. The plan is to grow the Von Schroeder's namesake, and winning Kaiba's little competition is believed by Siegfried to help sending investments flying through the roof for Schroeder Inc. You gotta love these corporate business play duels, am I right? As the battle goes on and we learn about Leon's traumatic past of loving duel monsters, as his form of escapism and how fairy-type cards came into existence thanks to him reaching out to Pegasus, we get more insight on the family dynamic. But in the duel, the secret card is revealed as Golden Castle Stromberg, a one-of-a-kind special printed card that was given to the winner of a tournament. As Siegfried had snuck this non-tournament legal card into the tournament when the systems were hacked, to recognize this card as fair play, Leon is being forced to use this and is genuinely conflicted, as he loves duel monsters, and playing this way doesn't feel right to do. Once he gets enough courage to stand up to his brother, he claims to no longer want to play this way. Using Using Mystical Space Tycoon to take out the field spell card, only to see that it couldn't be destroyed. With the card acting like a virus that can be activated like a switch, it is set to target every program Kaiba has, and Siegfried claims Kaiba is too late to do anything about it. Nothing can stop it at this point. Even if Leon were to surrender and end the duel, the only way to stop it is for it to be destroyed. Yugi speaks some truth to Leon about the true glory of a duelist and what that means, leading them to figure out a way together to carry on and destroy this card. Yugi finds an eventual expert of the card that results in it being destroyed, as Kaiba now works to secure the rest of his systems from the virus. With Yugi down to one card left though, Leon still tries to surrender for how unfair the match was, but Yugi convinces him to still play till the end with no worry of the other card anymore as they now continue, with Yugi still taking the overall win in the end, comforting him afterwards and still calling him a true duelist. Siegfried was able to get a bunch of files scrubbed from Kaiba's database, but Kaiba treats this as no big deal, as Siegfried is now all down in the dumps over his plan's not working in the end, as Leon offers up all of his advice that he can to his brother to maybe help make him a better person. And the day is saved, or at least the Kaiba Corporation is. Now Yugi and friends can all head back home after this stressful and really long trip to the US, thus bringing us to the end of the first arc for season 5 of Yu-Gi-Oh! So funny enough, there is a special mini arc that comes about after this, and before we move on to the big finale arc. I know, it feels like we keep getting Pharaoh blocked here, but this was a United States made and produced little series that came out the following year after season 5 came to an end, and is technically meant to be placed in between these two arcs that actually make up season 5. It's called Yu-Gi-Oh! Capsule Monsters, and no, it's not really related to the Capsule Monsters game that we see played in the manga. You can thank 4Kids for this, and it for sure is weird and highly debated if it's even good or not by the fans, so I guess that's for you to decide how you feel about it. So let's go over this small arc for a moment before we get into the big finale arc. There's more duels and more action when Yu-Gi-Oh! returns! And now, back to Yu-Gi-Oh! As this starts, Yugi is having nightmares about the Pharaoh being taken by some monster, and that something will become more clear if he plays the game. Waking up from the most recent nightmare, he notices the Millennium Puzzle is glowing, making him more curious to what this is all about. Life just isn't simple for little old Yugi Moto. Yugi spends the next day wondering where his grandpa is, as he was supposed to be back from some expedition he went on, but hadn't returned when he was supposed to, worrying Yugi of course. But much like when Dungeon Dice Monsters was hitting the scene, there's another new game on the block 
Black, a board game called Capsule Monsters that's in conjunction with Duel Monsters. Yugi is already familiar with the rules, as he is the king of games, but Joey announces a trip that he won that he is going to go on and has three extra tickets for his friends to come along. One for Yugi, one for Taya, and one for Tristan. So they all say yes and plan on going along with him. Now on their plane and arriving closer to where they were heading, the plane's engines end up stopping and the plane crashes into a random forest. Luckily, it wasn't any worse than it was, as everyone seems to be okay, getting off the plane and finding a man named Dr. Brisbane, a colleague of Yugi's grandpa who tells Yugi that his grandpa had gone missing on their expedition after Yugi recognized the bandana this guy had with him. Yami is naturally skeptical about this as everything seems too coincidental when linking it all together. Dr. Brisbane brings them to where Yugi's grandpa was last seen, that being a pyramid, but not just any pyramid. This one happens to be the Pyramid of Alexander the Great, containing some ancient game within it, making their way past all the dangers within that are meant to keep people out as they end up finding a massive room with the floor resembling a giant map with different zones, containing different looking lands. Yugi takes a second to understand what they're looking at, but Joey disappears into thin air when he was trying to go check this out as they believe the same thing must have happened to Yugi's grandpa, so they all follow suit and do the same thing while the doctor stays behind for now. Where the group had went now looks like another forest, as Joey is already gone by the time the rest of the group shows up. But not long into taking everything in, giant bugs start attacking them, sending the three of them in different directions, splitting them up as Yugi has to deal with the large praying mantis as he touches one of these egg-like rocks that summons the Celtic Guardian, as it now defends them from the praying mantis. Taya and Tristan lose the cockroaches that were chasing them in a cave that then leads them to a beach as other monsters are now with them as well. We get to see what happened to Joey as he is up on top of a mountain looking into the woods to locate the others, hearing Yugi in the distance, but Joey is picked up by another creature and taken away. The Celtic Guardian then gets sucked into this strange device on their arm after saying that he will serve them, and then turns into a small capsule as Yugi truly sees that this is in fact some large real version of the Capsule Monsters game. They then acknowledge the weird device that's on their arm that acts as a launcher to summon the monsters they get as capsules. When they test this against some of the enemies, the Celtic Guardian comes out, but when it gets hurt, they end up feeling the same pain. This isn't just a silly little real-life version of Capsule Monsters. This is somehow a shadow game with real consequences. But in knowing this, Yugi starts learning how to navigate and play by whatever rules there are. Joey's adventure gets a little bit slapstick, but eventually he accidentally releases Baby Dragon, who aids him in getting away from his situation and saves him. For Tristan and Taya, figuring out what these non-hostile monsters are doing around them, they feel that these must be the monsters that they released from some of those egg rocks without knowing it. And then when they are attacked on the beach, both their creatures, Thunder Kid and Happy Lover, step in to help out. Joey ends up finding a chest that unlocks a map to the area, or maybe a treasure map, as Joey would like that. But then Taya remembers what Yugi taught her earlier about capsule monsters, and starts using tactics to heal their creatures and take out the monster that attacked them. But surprise, it was just evolving into a more powerful beast, sending them into a typhoon, but Yugi's grandpa shows up, saving them with Summon Skull, which from a distance catches Yugi's attention to head to that direction, and eventually catches up with them, excited to actually see his grandpa alive and well, as they still wonder where Joey is at and worry about him. But he's fine, he makes it to their campfire and the gang end up having to make a getaway from some more creatures that come after them. As time goes on, they all find it harder to survive out in this land, not really having food or a shelter. Times are tough here. Joey and Tristan treat this whole adventure like an RPG where every time they do something remotely aiding in their survival, they do a little victory dance. Uh, too much of it, maybe. Later on, they end up finding some temple at the center of a lake, getting inside of it and taking refuge there for now, but then seeing a teapot. But really, it was just a magical genie lamp, bringing out La Jin, the mystical genie of the lamp. Celtic Guardian comes out to fight it, but then water comes rushing through the door, and then freezing, turning Taya and Yugi's grandpa into popsicles, as they are attacked by another monster, and they try and pit both monsters against each other, and once they do, they end up taking each other out. With the people popsicles, or the piopicles, are now freed from the frozen state. And there's never a dull moment here, as then a tablet with Egyptian writing on it shows up, as Yugi's grandpa starts translating it, giving them a riddle of what to do to escape from this place. They take a look at Joey's map to see where their journey is going to take them given the text that was translated, finding where this fortress is, but it's a trek and a half away. Tristan though comes in clutch, finding a secret passageway underneath the floor, and everyone heads through it. The adventures carry on, more monsters are captured, and more monsters are fought, as they get to the fortress only for some walls to appear, representing four types of spirits, rock, aqua, wind, and fire, now being trapped and trying to get out through a door by mimicking the stances of 
the statues around them, letting Yugi go through to the fortress by himself as he falls into a pit, but Yami comes through to save them. Inside, Yugi finds a new capsule, getting him the Dark Magician. How convenient. The Dark Magician helps save the others from the statues that had come to life outside, as the Summoned Skull ends up defeated from the battle. Inside the fortress is a coffin that eventually turns into a doorway, showcasing some gold armor along with more riddles to follow, with Yugi getting the armor, whether or not he wanted it. The riddles talk about five trials that will test Yugi's heart as they decide to continue on if it leads them home, as they must face these trials, whatever they are. Eventually, they arrive at a village as they are given a pendant, and some details about the first trial, as they all come face to face with a bunch of sandworms like it's Dune or something, as Yugi is the only one not turned to stone from the encounter trying to deal with all of them. And as he tries to push forward to this mysterious voice controlling all of this, he at one point fuses with the Dark Magician to have the strength to make it through, finding the voice and telling it to zip it, clearing the first trial, and returning his friends from their stone state. Yami and Yugi switch who is in control based on how much of a toll is taken on them, working this way to not overexert themselves. A doorway appears for them to exit through as now they are in the clouds on an island, with the next trial's task given to them as they now must break an apparent unbreakable stone, when it appears for a limited time once every day. While Yugi is drained of energy thanks to the armor itself, Joey, Tristan, and his grandpa try to go out and help, and take care of the task, only knowing half of what to do as Yugi realizes this when he has some energy and goes after them, thinking that they can be in grave danger. The others get caught in part two of the trial, getting greeted by a skull guardian that attacks them as Yugi once again combined with the dark magician swoops in and defeats the monster, though he spares its life as showing mercy was part of the trial. A masked man that they saw before comes by to tell Yugi and the others congratulations, as the second trial is now passed. The man explains that completing the trials will grant Yugi the power to be the ruler of the world, if proven to be the one true king. There are others after it as well, those with evil intentions, giving the pharaoh a reason to still go after it regardless if he even wants to be crowned that and have that power. If they end up failing this, they would be trapped here until the next trial challenger arrives. They now get some items from a chest that grants them wings so they can fly through the next doorway, heading straight to a volcano. Meanwhile, on the outside of the game, Dr. Brisbane is not a good guy, enjoying the thought of soon he might just have the power to rule the world. Hmm. Yeah, he for sure was the bad guy from the jump, pretty easy to tell. At one point in this area, Joey gets separated from the group, but he does return not long later, and now he's all evil and fused with the red eyes black dragon, fighting Yugi in his dark magician form, but Joey snaps out of it, realizing that this has only happened after he fused with the red eyes. In his leg though is the blade of chaos, and he then removes it, technically clearing the third trial, and fully gains the bond with red eyes, getting themselves the next doorway. Now they are back in a forest setting, seeing an endless sea of trees as they must find a golden apple as an offering. This turns out to be a lot more stressful than just going apple picking, as they fight monsters, deal with mazes, and eventually having to eat apples so that Yugi can evolve his dark magician into the magician of black chaos, helping them deal with everything further and bringing the correct apple to an altar, opening the next doorway that brings them right where they started when they came all together at the campfire. The masked man shows up again and reveals himself to in fact be Alexander the Great, in the flesh, and talks about having the Millennium Ring at one point in his life, and how through it, he was able to conquer so much of the world until the evil within it caused a split personality to break free, as he faced Shadi in tests to see if he was worthy or not, being the first person to face these trials, conquering them, but the final door would still not open, making the evil spirit inside of him angry and more of a ruthless, destructive tyrant, as then the pyramid split his soul in two, sealing away the dark side of his soul into the pyramid, and his good side now being meant to stay here as a guide for those who come into the game in the future. He then talks about the fifth trial, and what to expect, having to face five elemental dragons that are labeled as the Fiendish Five, that reign terror over the land. As they get ready for the battle, they find a girl getting ready to sacrifice herself in the name of the dragon god, to have that god help keep the other dragons away from hurting their village anymore. They stop her from doing so and claim that they will slay the dragons, as each of them take on a dragon individually, but in the end, our group here is defeated. As they rest from this, Yugi learns of a special sword that can slay the dragons when they all come together to the village, tricking them to all come right towards the village, and once they're there, he then slays all of them. But then phase two kicks in, as all of the dragons then transform into five-headed dragon. The girl prays for salvation from her god, setting free the blue-eyes white dragon as Yugi fuses with it to then defeat the five-headed dragon to complete the final trial. As they get ready to leave, and there's some suspicions about of where the evil Alexander the Great may be, the good Alexander the Great has a chance to finally exit the game now through the use of Yugi's grandpa's body. When they leave the game, they run into the doctor, unaware 
aware of the evil person he truly is and seems to be looking for something they may have found, and Grandpa hands him the trial pendant, just trying to see if the evil Alexander is there. And it was, as the evil side of Alexander within the doctor tries to take it, giving the good Alexander within Grandpa a chance to jump over into the doctor's body as well to fight off the evil side. But it was all bait as the evil side overpowers the good Alexander to get stronger, getting the pendant and running towards a door not opened in thousands of years as the door opened up and everyone is now in an alternate dimension. Shadi appears once more and waits to see who will win in this struggle to earn the promised power of the challenge. Shadi allows Alexander, even though he's evil right now, a fair shake at this since he did complete the challenges at one point before, as it would now be a showdown between our heroes and Alexander through a capsule monster battle. Alexander fuses with Reshiv the Dark Being and summons Seven Armed Fiend, the creature from Yugi's recurring nightmares. The Pharaoh ends up feeling disgusted at how Alexander treats his followers, drawing more connection to the growth the Pharaoh has with his lack of memory, powering up through his friend's dragons now to form the armor of unity to defeat Alexander, getting rid of his evil side as the good Alexander is free as he lets the Pharaoh know that he thought the Pharaoh's rule of Egypt was great and it inspired him to be a Pharaoh as well. Chadi appears to now grant the Pharaoh the power he has earned, but he declines it, leaving feeling like Yami's decision was smart and says some more philosophical sounding things as the pyramid is now breaking down with everyone getting out just fine. And they make it back to their pilots, back where they crash to see that the rescue plan is there and ready to take them back home. And that's it for this small, kinda weird, sometimes fun, definitely history changing arc. Yeah, so this series was basically what if Yu-Gi-Oh was kinda like Pokemon in a way. Like, in a way. That's not necessarily a bad thing, there were some pretty cool ideas here, but from watching it, you can see that 4Kids was responsible for whatever this random added on extra arc was. There's more duels and more action when Yu-Gi-Oh returns! And now, back to Yu-Gi-Oh! Now that that's all out of the way and said and done, it's time to finally head back to the past. We open up this arc with Bakura being haunted by a voice as he runs scared from whatever it is. He ends up going inside of a church where all of the candles are lit up mysteriously with the voice catching up and telling him he has a role to step into as you can hear the voice be that of Yami Bakura, going beyond something just tethered to the Millennium Ring. But there's another voice speaking in unison as they explain further about Yugi getting all of the Millennium items sooner or later. But in order to unlock the door of the Realm of the Dead, an eighth key is needed, going off of Merrick's mention of it to them during the Battle City arc, as to get the final piece of the puzzle, they believe it to be within the Pharaoh's memories. The voices then take control of Bakura. From here, we cut back to a younger version of Yugi's grandpa, Solomon, as he is in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, the burial grounds for where the Pharaohs lie. For the nameless Pharaoh's tomb, no one has really explored it except for one villager who is stuck repeating the same phrase of the Dark Game. The journey through the tomb is not easy, facing trials within in the different rooms, as when they get to a bridge, he is betrayed by his guides, sending him falling off the side, only to be saved by the spirit of the Pharaoh, helping him continue to find the Millennium Puzzle. Something of note is that the Pharaoh refers to him as Shimon, recognizing the similar look Solomon has to someone from the past that he mistakes him for. This was all being told by Yugi's grandpa to Yugi before his big trip to Egypt in the morning to finally focus on helping the Pharaoh with his memories, but in the middle of the night, Weevil and Rex are back and break into his room, stealing his god cards and the Millennium items that he has, but not long into their getaway, the Millennium Ring activates, flying over to Yami Bakura, knocking them out as Yugi arrives to deal with Bakura. He lets Yugi get all of his stuff back aside from the ring and maybe something else, as Yugi realizes that Yami Bakura is back. For now, they both hold back a bit of information about what lies next with all of the Millennium items being all assembled in one place, as Bakura claims he will help him, and with Yami Yugi coming out now to try and know Bakura's true intentions. Yami Bakura explains that he and the Pharaoh are not so different, both being sealed souls and items for 5,000 years. He claims to not know what his own intentions are, hoping that the Pharaoh's memories can be the gateway to paint that picture more vividly, going further to claim that the Pharaoh started the ultimate dark game in general, telling him they should settle this in the world of memories, and once they open the door to go there, the game will fully start. Parting ways to prepare for this after, Yami agrees to do this. Bakura heads over to see Kaiba at work and attacks Mokuba to get Kaiba out to face him in a duel. As the duel goes on for 
a while and Bakura is just testing the cards that he has, the next day is already starting, as Bakura claims that he needs to go, but not before handing Kaiba the Millennium Eye, telling Kaiba that if he wants to learn more about his bond with the Blue Eyes White Dragon, just giving him a little bit of temptation as he leaves. Yugi is ready to leave, but his friends wouldn't let him go on his own, as they board the flight as well. They now arrive in Cairo, meeting up with Merrick, Odeon, and Ishizu, as they head to the Tomb of Lost Memories, where Yugi holds up his Egyptian god cards to the tablet as it pulls the spirit of the pharaoh into the past, while Bakura walks in with Yami Bakura's soul joining in, as they now both arrive in the world of memories, as the pharaoh is getting brought to his coronation ceremony, with his visor Shimon escorting him along the way. The pharaoh then gets brought to a meeting with his royal court, with the members, known as the Sacred Guardians, each hold a millennium item. At one point, an attempt on the pharaoh's life happens when someone breaks in to go after him, getting caught and put on a millennium trial, as the Sacred Guardians extract an evil monster from the intruder's heart, and seal it away in a stone tablet as the intruder is then set free. Bakura ends up going into who he was in the past, Thief King Bakura. Shadi appears to those waiting in modern day to explain what the pharaoh may be facing in the past, re-experiencing their own history and playing the ultimate game. Speaking of that, back in the past, Bakura shows up in the area, ready to start off the game. Shadi takes Yugi and his friends into the Millennium Puzzle as he tries to lead them to the pharaoh's mind as the sacred guardians are preparing a sealed tablet with Bakura storming the premises. The Millennium Key is used to reveal the Ka or spirit monster within Bakura, but the monster is too powerful for the size of the tablet that they have, immediately freeing itself. We then see modern day Kaiba pondering over the eye for a while before he says screw it and heads to Egypt himself. The Guardians start activating this ancient dual disc-like technology that binds the wearer's Ba or spirit energy to some Ka for their stone tablets to have control over them. As Bakura is running through the place left and right, the Pharaoh eventually steps in and summons Obelisk the Tormentor, but Bakura's Diabound repels the attacks as it results in a draw between the monsters. Bakura grabs his horse and heads out of the area for now. In the sky, though, is an inverted pyramid as the pharaoh is the only one who can truly see it, or so we think, as he's cautious of what this really means. Meanwhile, we get to meet other characters like Mana, who is a childhood friend of the pharaoh as Bakura plans his next attack, wanting to get the millennium items but do so at a reasonable pace, and not all at once. We get a flashback to the pharaoh's past with Mahad, one of the sacred guardians and a friend of the pharaoh since they were kids, and when growing up, seeing Mahad always looking out for him as the pharaoh, the pharaoh never understood the whole class system, wanting a society without a class system. For now, in the modern day of the past time of 5,000 years ago, Mahad vows to take down Bakura as later on the two of them come face to face alone. As their battle goes on, the Pharaoh and Mana realize something is wrong with Mahad, trying to figure out what is happening, and during the battle we get to see the creation of the Dark Magician, as Mahad gives his spirit to the Illusion Magician, creating the Dark Magician as he himself is slain by Bakura, as Bakura now gets the Millennium Ring back. But the Dark Magician still defeats Diabound, and then the Dark Magician turns into a stone tablet with Mahad's spirit infused in it. Yugi and friends with the help of Shadi have finally found the correct passage to the memory world as they're now searching for the pharaoh. They are also practically invisible within this world as technically none of them existed in this time. We get to spend time seeing the operations and responsibilities of the others like Seto, not the future Seto Kaiba but the Seto priest from the past that he does have some relation to, having to make tough calls under the rule that he has, thinking he is doing what is right for the sake of keeping the land safe while some others may disagree agree with his actions, but it seems like in his heart that he truly does want to do good. As Bakura harms another person close to the pharaoh and the sacred guardians, this time being Seto's father, who is also the pharaoh's uncle, causes the pharaoh to head out after Bakura, sending out Slifer the Sky Dragon to help in the situation. But in the meantime, we also have a deeper dive into the creation of the Millennium Items, as they were created under the sacrifice of souls to even be forged. As Seto's dad lies awake in wounded pain, his heart had been corrupted by Bakura, and sees the pharaoh is not fit for for the job, wanting Seto to become the one that sits on the throne. With the pharaoh still after Bakura, Bakura ends up causing more chaos than he does trying to even combat the pharaoh, as Slifer picks up Diabound and carries the beast high into the skies until Bakura activates dissimulation in walls to hide itself for a sneak attack on Slifer. Bakura threatens the pharaoh to give up the puzzle or watch his precious city burn as the fight goes sideways for the pharaoh, as we see back with the stone tablets that Slifer's stone is getting messed with, harming it for the actual battle as Slifer gets eventually taken out, as then the pharaoh faints from the life energy drained from him, and when he comes to, Yugi and his friends are there, and he can actually see them like he can see the pyramid in the sky. They are able to transfer energy into the pharaoh to get him back to feeling better, as he gets back on his horse and brings out the winged dragon of Ra, as Seto joins in and has Duos out to help protect Ra 
as the Pharaoh has Ra turn into the Egyptian god Phoenix and take out Bakura's monster. But Bakura pulls a Prince of Persia here, using an item called the Sands of Time to reverse the events of what just happened, right back to when Slifer was just destroyed and transporting Yugi and the others further away so they won't recreate what just happened. Having the Pharaoh fall into a worse situation now as Bakura takes the Millennium Puzzle. This double fringe miss is brought to you by Gamer Subs. I just got one word for you, but come close. You gotta make sure you listen to this one. Use code fringe for 10% off at Gamer Subs. Look, the choice is yours. You can either pay an extra 10% or you can save the 10%. Use code FRINGE. Gamer subs. In the background of this, Seto's father has started his plans for his son to take the seat of the throne, showing him a massive army of Ka, and along with this, he is forcing a girl named Kisara to fight others held captive to try and bring forth the spirit beast of the blue eyes white dragon that she holds. Seto takes his role very seriously and still believes that the Pharaoh is alive out there, even if they haven't found them yet, and he also has a deep connection with this girl. Yugi and the others are also out there looking for where the Pharaoh went, running into Mana who can see them, and together they find the Pharaoh. Pharaoh resting in a cave with bad injuries from what had happened. Mana and Yugi have a whole, hey, you look like the dark magician girl, oh no way, you look like the Pharaoh exchange, with their time together this episode. Once the Pharaoh is good and back in the battle here, he heads after Bakura, as now he has the spirit of Mahad within the dark magician that he uses, as Mana comes in with her spirit monster being the dark magician girl, eh, go figure, as the two magicians work together to take up Bakura's beast. The other guardians show up to help out as well, but the beast has grown too powerful thanks to the dead spirits from the city where the Millennium items were made, being absorbed into the beast. Bakura also continues to gain more Millennium items, while Seto's father does his bidding for him, back where the stone tablets are, as his beast's tablet was going to be destroyed to kill the beast, but Seto's father stops this, taking out the Guardian and grabbing the Millennium Key. With no other options with the defeat being too great, the Pharaoh then starts sacrificing his life so that the souls would take him, as they begin dragging him into the Shadow Realm. But his father's soul, the King Pharaoh's soul, saves him from this and offers his life instead, and Bakura's beast is weakened and destroyed. Yami Bakura leaves the body of his ancient self as it becomes useless and then turns to sand. Yugi and the others figure out that to help out and learn more, they must focus on doing something important, like finding out the pharaoh's real name, all while someone in the group, aka Tristan, has his mind taken from Yami Bakura, as he tries to blend in without suspicion in order to find the eighth missing key and possible other information that is needed for Yami Bakura's own plans. We eventually cut to a meeting of Yami Yugi and Yami Bakura sitting across from one another another at a table that has a field on it that represents ancient Egypt, almost like a meeting of the minds here, discussing about this being the biggest shadow game here, explaining that the past can very much be affected here to change anything if the pharaoh doesn't win the game overall. The evil demonic force of Zork is out there and looming, as the preparations for his summoning are happening, and Zork has the power to destroy everyone in the past, and as things now look dire, Zork is now brought forth partially, and Seto's father is granted a special wish for starting the summoning, wishing that his son would be become the pharaoh, as Zork then turns the father into the great shadow Magus making him a powerful being as well. Yami Bakura warns Yami Yugi that the hourglass tokens are running out by the second, but Kaiba now arrives in Egypt, getting brought to the tablet as Yami Bakura enacts his other setup, pulling Kaiba into the shadow game as it can feed off of his energy to resurrect Thief King Bakura. A character named Barbosa leads Yugi and the others to the Valley of the Kings to learn the real name of the Pharaoh, while the Thief King version of Bakura ends up getting all of the Millennium Items, using them to bring back his beast in a more powerful than ever state, as things get more heated and time is ticking, the pharaoh is forced to face off against Seto, after his mind was corrupted by his father, as the battle between the pharaoh's dark magician and Seto's now blue-eyes white dragon he acquired after Kassara's life was taken protecting him from his dad, and has her soul now infused with the blue eyes, starts to take place. Eventually in this battle, the blue eyes with the soul of Kassara ends up destroying the control over Seto, sending his father to the shadow realm. As Yugi and the others get to where they will learn the pharaoh's real name, Yami Bakura takes over Tristan fully to trap them in the tomb and not let them leave as time has run out for the birth of Zork. Thief King Bakura and his beast are sacrificed for this and go into the Millennium Stone, as Zork now fully emerges, and all of this energy shatters the Millennium Stone, scattering the Millennium Items across the land. The pharaoh and the priest ride back heading towards the palace so they can figure out how to stop Zork, as the guardians protect them with their lives, and as all of this is affecting the past, it's also being 
being affected in the real world as well with natural disasters, as this power is beyond comprehension. All Yami Bakura needs is the Pharaoh's real name to bring forth Zork fully in the real world, as Yami Bakura, as Tristan, duels Yugi to see who has the freedom to leave with the name of the Pharaoh to do what they need to do for their goals of either saving the world or ending it. As the others in Memory World try holding off Zork, even seeing Exodia being summoned to help out as well, and not being strong enough, it's a total massacre. Later on, all of the Millennium items are fully brought to the Pharaoh as he faces down Zork, summoning the Egyptian god cards to combat the beast, but even then, they weren't enough. Yugi ends up defeating Yami Bakura and is able to leave to get to the Pharaoh, as Seto in the past turns to stone after his blue eyes, after him and his blue eyes help as best as they could. The modern day Kaiba gets into the game by using his blue eyes ultimate dragon, as the power of the blue eyes and Zork are pretty much matched, but explosive enough to open a rift between the memory world and the real one. Pharaoh fuses himself with the black luster soldier and even then, further combines with the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon to become Dragon Master Knight, but ultimately loses, making it seem like the Pharaoh was killed off. Yugi and the others show up now to try and help, but the one thing that could, the Pharaoh's name, is useless to them as they can't read the ancient text to say it. They eventually get the text to the Pharaoh, who is still alive and reads his name as Atem, instantly giving him a resurgence of divine power, bringing the God cards back to fuse them together to make the Creator of Light with infinite attack and defense, and in one shot, Zork is defeated and this time for good. In the end, Atem gives the priest Seto, who has now revived the Millennium Items, giving him the title of the actual Pharaoh as Atem dissipates, with Seto claiming to be a just ruler, as they all leave Memory World for now. The last bit of episodes here are technically under their own small arc called the Final Duel, as everyone returns back to the present day. At this point, Atem has made the decision to lock the Millennium Items away, and with that, himself. But the only way for this to happen, as a rite of passage ceremony that consists of someone having to beat him in a duel. Yugi gets the right to do this for the bond that he and Atem have shared throughout the series. They spend their nights preparing the best decks possible as they emotionally build up to the day they both knew would eventually come. After placing all the items back in the correct slots in the Millennium Stone, Atem and Yugi become two separate entities, with the duel deciding the fate of what happened. Atem doesn't go easy on Yugi in the duel though, using the full force of all three god cards to really have Yugi go through the ringer to show how much skills he truly has. Is he the king of games without the help of the Pharaoh, it's time to find out. Even when backed into a corner, Yugi is able to successfully counter the God cards, and even take each one of them out through pure defense and counter strategies. Atem counted on this though, knowing Yugi would be good enough to pull off something like that, as they keep going on from there, and bring us to a point where Atem brings out the one and only Dark Magician, and not much longer summons Dark Magician Girl, but Yugi forces him to sacrifice them to protect his life points thanks to the card of Sanctuary, and his Silent Magician just getting more power. Powerful. Atem tries to use Monster Reborn to bring back Slifer the Sky Dragon, but Yugi's Gold Sarcophagus had the Monster Reborn card sealed away there, meaning that neither Monster Reborn could be used. Without any defenses left, Atem is wide open as Yugi defeats him in the duel, but falls to his knees in sadness over this being the last time he will ever see him again. The two share an emotional moment, and in the end, Atem is set free to go into the afterlife, leaving in the coolest way possible. The Millennium Stone then crumbles, as all of the items fall deep within a pit, burying them, thus ending the story of Generation 1 of Yu-Gi-Oh!, completing all five seasons of what the characters have gone through and accomplished, leading up to so many reveals and crazy moments, as now the Pharaoh Atem is gone and Yugi is going forward to live his life and continue his story. But there is a little bit more. There's more duels and more action when Yu-Gi-Oh! returns! And now, back to Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, just because the series itself is over, it doesn't mean that this is the end of Yugi and his friends' stories. In fact, there are two movies that happen way later on past the ending of season five that give us some more story. One is a little one, and one is a lot. So let's jump into our first movie here, Yu-Gi-Oh! Bonds Beyond Time. Oh wait, sorry, Yu-Gi-Oh! 3D Bonds Beyond Time. I never saw it in 3D, but that was released during the big 3D film craze at the start of the 2010s. This one was a celebration for the series as it tried to bring together the three generations of main protagonists, OG Yugi, Jaden, and Yusei, from the original series, the GX series, and the 5D series, respectively. The story starts off in some apocalyptic future as humans are going extinct. We meet a character named Paradox, not to be confused with the brothers Para and Dox from Duelist Kingdom, as he wants to head back in time to save his timeline by killing the creator of duel monsters, Pegasus. We first see that Paradox invades the timeline of Yusei, bringing him into the mix of the story, along with hopping to Jaden's timeline next, as these two 
protagonists now team up as they see the events of the past have been changed, erasing their cards from history. Together, they head back even further in time, entering Yugi's timeline where it takes place roughly between the end of Battle City, but before the events of Season 4, as to not undo the continuity from the end of Season 5 of Yugi's original generation. At this time, Pegasus is seemingly throwing a random tournament that ends up getting crashed by the appearance of dual monsters that Paradox had stolen from the other's timelines, as they then attack, basically killing everyone there aside from Yugi, but one of them being Yugi's grandpa. As Yugi cries over this, he notices the villain Paradox finding amusement in what just happened, as Crimson Dragon appears from a rift that then gets Yugi and brings him back an hour earlier in time, as both Yusei and Jaden explain to him what is going on, getting Yugi on board to fight with them to stop Paradox. Once they get to him and confront him, they get into a three-on-one battle that has a time limit of 20 minutes, as that's when Pegasus is scheduled to arrive and Paradox can enact his plan. With the others getting ready for it, Yugi tells Yami that this will be their toughest duel yet. My guy, no it won't. Together, all three of them activate their dual discs and begin the duel. And that's just a cool scene. As this goes on, the three of them have to work together as a group of people that really know nothing about each other. And through this battle, we see them develop some bonds with one another, which makes the title of the movie make sense. We see some established monsters from the three of them. And of course, in the end, they end up defeating Paradox in the duel, and he's just never seen again. Collectively, they killed a guy. Now that the day is saved, Pegasus finally arrives safe and sound at the event, and the three of them say their goodbyes, all hoping to have individual duels with one another at some point. The others return to their future timelines as Yusei ends the movie, saying that the actual magic that comes from duel monsters is the bonds that people make while playing. Okay, while that's a bit cheesy, that sentiment is pretty true for those who actually play the card game in real life. The one thing that I never liked about this film in particular is that the fact it really only brings the three together as a novelty that wraps things up with a pretty lackluster and not too exciting battle, Yugi is really just there to be there because he's a protagonist, as this felt like they were trying to focus on propping up 5Ds more than anything. Which, to be fair, makes sense for when this came out, but it didn't feel like a celebration, but more so fanfare for the sake of it. Sure, I like fan service here and there, I'm a fan, service me, but I felt that it lacked a lot of purpose after just getting the three of them together. Was it cool to see? Yeah. Was it incredible? I wouldn't say so, but that's just me. You tell me how you feel. Okay, let's talk about the final movie now. Yu-Gi-Oh! The Dark Side of Dimension, aka the epilogue to Yugi and his friends story that takes place after the events of season 5, and life has gone on with our group of friends, after the Pharaoh's spirit has gone away. They all go about their normal lives, going to school and spend time discussing what their futures hold for them. Taya gets accepted into a program overseas for her to follow suit in being a professional dancer, Tristan has a job waiting for him at his father's factory, and he isn't really looking forward to it all that much, Joey wants to stay focused on dual monsters and become a true professional duelist, and Yugi holds his dream of staying at home and helping his grandpa run the game shop while spending extra time developing his own games. It's just some wholesome friend stuff as they support one another and seek to always be friends no matter what. As school continues, a new student is there as they feel some familiarity towards him, but they aren't too sure. His name is Agami. After school, we see that Yugi still thinks about the Pharaoh, reminding us of what happened at the end of the series. Joey ends up seeing Agame getting messed with by some others as they leave for now but threaten Agame to show up to a construction site later, or else, as Agame then thanks them for the help in getting those guys to leave. Later on, he still goes out to meet those who picked on him, as when he shows up, they continue to torment him. But he pulls out his quantum cube that ends up showing some glowing-eyed kids around the group, as Agame showcases a symbol on his head as the bullies all start to glow. Cutting away from this, we suddenly see Yami Yugi getting engaged in a duel with Kaiba, as he ends up defeating Yami, revealing that this was all a simulation with Kaiba being displeased as it hasn't captured how Yami would actually have played, getting interrupted by Mokuba informing him that through their excavations in the modern day, they have found the Millennium Puzzle, being the one thing Kaiba needs to really get a thorough duel with the Pharaoh himself. Later on, Yugi and the gang are with Bakura, eating at Duke's Cafe, as Yugi sees the news of the gang that was messing with Agami now have gone missing. We get a moment with Agami that shows him in this special area above the clouds, seeing pillars that represent the Millennium Items, along with getting a flashback to him in Egypt being with his sister Sarah, as she refers to him as the name Diva instead. Agami is given information regarding Kaiba finding the Millennium Puzzle, as he then teleports away. Kaiba though ends up taking over all of the TV screens around, announcing his brand new dual disc, and is showing it off at Kaiba Land. Kaiba's life is so crazy, Kaiba Land is massive, he still has the cool blue eyes white jet, and he even has this ridiculous space station that has an elevator that connects all the way back down to Earth? Why? Because why not? But while the Kaiba brothers ponder over the puzzle, Kaiba feels the presence of someone else, calling out to Agami and saying his name as Diva as well, with Kaiba having kept tabs
tabs on him and finds it odd how he got to Egypt so fast having just been back in Domino City. In a show of force, Agami uses his quantum cube to make a Kaiba Corp employee disappear after he was threatened by him. As they now end up getting into a duel, Kaiba surprises him at one point as he summons Obelisk the Tormentor, but the duel gets interrupted as the puzzle had finished scanning, with Mokuba taking it with him on a helicopter as Agami tries to teleport to it and then take the puzzle for himself. As Kaiba has what he wants anyway, he just gets in his jet and leaves. As one of Agami's associates named Manny sees what was left behind here, the Millennium Ring. Later on, Agami reveals to Sarah that he didn't truly battle Kaiba, but he did manage to take a piece of the Millennium Puzzle from Mokuba before coming back. Technically, two pieces. Giving her a piece and telling her to keep it safe. Agami then tries to get in closer with Yugi and his friends, wanting to know more about them. And through their time together, Agami gets to hear all about the fun adventures the group has gone on and been a part of, and ends up wanting to challenge Yugi to a duel as Joey jumps in to say that he has to go through him first. Joey then invites them over to have a fun duel tournament, with Kaiba now being back in his space station as his computer is trying to put together the pieces of the Millennium Puzzle, with Kaiba chomping at the bit to get a big real battle here. Agami heads over to Yugi's with the others, holding his quantum cube, claiming it to just be a deck box to not make things weird. Sarah though enters into the game shop when Yugi is there setting up things for the tournament, taking notice of the original box for the Millennium Puzzle, as he uses it as his own deck box of sorts, as she then shows him this other realm known as the Plano Realm. Seeing the pillars we were shown before, and as this ends, they are back at the shop, with Sarah nowhere to be found, but within Yugi's puzzle box lies that one piece of the Millennium Puzzle Sarah was given. Which is certainly odd, but back at the International Kaiba Space Station, Kaiba waits for the puzzle to be completed, but the computer then reports in that there are two pieces in fact missing. As Kaiba casually gets angry about this, but thinks back to what happened and believes this is Agami's fault. Speaking of him, he's still with Bakura and Joey, as he wants to know more about Bakura's past, as Bakura was initially sharing some details about his father's search for the Millennium Ring, as Agami starts forcing him to continue, causing Bakura to panic as he would rather not relive certain details. The weird ghost kids show up again, freaking out Joey, as Agami sends Joey to a different dimension, as he ends up in a road where the whole dimension is based on Joey's memories, and if he forgets anything, it will disappear from it. But Joey uses this to then create more of his memories, as Agami catches on to what Joey is trying to do, which is trying to find a way to outsmart him here, and begins to erase his memories as the world he is in begins to start closing in on him. At the same time, Yugi is just patiently waiting at the shop for his friends, wondering where they're at, as Tristan comes by thinking something has happened to Joey, after he found his dual disc and bike left randomly in the road, knowing that he would never do this, so they hop on his motorcycle and try and go find Joey and meet up with Teya. Agami now takes aim at Bakura, who is still in a state of panic, as Agami initiates a flashback, showing a group of children being around Shadi. Among the children are Agami, Sarah, and Manny, as we see the full tablet of the Pharaoh's memories being there, with it still having the Millennium Scale and Ring within it, as Shadi gives context to the items, claiming that three of the Millennium items are a representation of justice, while three of the others are weak and open to evil, while the Millennium Puzzle itself holds both justice and evil, balancing everything out and giving context to the Pharaoh himself based on the evil within the Pharaoh's heart that we dealt with in Season 4. Shadi tells the children about a better world being accessible if all of the Millennium items are gathered together, and they would all be allowed to go there, as they are chosen to do so, with Agami wanting to go to this world. This now continues as we see Bakura's father finding the Millennium Ring, after dedicating his whole life to looking for it, trying to buy it off Shadi, and while Shadi declines, he allows him to try it on, putting him in a test of worthiness. It's not too long before he takes it off and tosses it away, as he is then attacked by some shadow snakes, as a young Bakura, who tells him to quickly put it back on, grabs the ring as a light shines from it, giving us the first connection of Yami Bakura taking over Bakura, becoming one with the ring, melting right into his skin. Yami Bakura gives Shadi a nice thank you for giving him a good host body, striking a fatal blow to Shadi as now the children rush to his side as he gives Agami the quantum cube while he passes away, with Yami Bakura then slaughtering the other kids as Agami and Sarah end up making it out of there alive. From this vision of the past, Bakura is devastated at what he has seen, pleading with Agami that this wasn't his fault, it was all the ring's doing, or more so, Yami Bakura's doing, continuing to apologize for what happened as Manny appears with the ring and attempts to kill Bakura in revenge, but gets control of himself after being guided by the evil within the ring. Bakura was then sent to another dimension for now, while Agami and Manny head to another one as well. But Manny ends up apparently dying and disappearing as Agami contemplates taking the ring for himself, but stops as he hears Yugi out looking for Joey. From here, Agami goes to confront Yugi, telling him that he is a Plana, and to give you an explanation of this is really just explaining why he has these powers in a way, as the Plana are essentially a collective consciousness that can bend reality and this was given on to people from the Pharaoh 
Pharaoh as he went on to the afterlife, only having these abilities unless the Pharaoh returns, giving Agami a reason to not let the Pharaoh return once more. He tells Yugi that he implanted a memory, just like Inception, that Agami seems familiar for whatever reason, and then he reveals that his name is actually Diva. Cutting back to Joey, his dimension is almost gone as he starts fading away as well, until he sees a glimpse of Atem, suddenly now finding himself in the real world where Yugi and the others are happy to find him as he tells them that Bakura needs some help as well. Diva leaves for now as Joey holds back from telling Yugi about seeing Atem as they continue their search for Bakura. While Diva is alone now on a roof, he ends up being taken by some employees of Kaiba Corp and brought right to Kaiba who tries to get the pieces of the puzzle back from him. Yugi ends up seeing a commotion and noticing that Kaiba is the cause of it as Kaiba tells Yugi to play in an exhibition duel at Kaiba Land as he then shows Yugi the nearly put together Millennium Puzzle and tells Yugi that Diva's responsible for the missing pieces as he leaves with him for now, telling Yugi that he wants a real duel with the other Yugi. After he leaves, Yugi sees his puzzle box in the road and grabs it as Sarah saves him from traffic, with her telling him to complete the Millennium Puzzle once more and to save her brother. Diva later wakes up, being tied to a chair in a glass box, as the Kaiba brothers watch over him, messing with him over knowing about where the other pieces actually are. At the special duel stadium at Kaiba Land, Kaiba shows off his Neo Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. While he talks about his new duel disc to everyone, he then also announces his exhibition matches as he will face off against both Yugi and Agami for their pieces of the puzzle that they hold. Sarah shows up to Diva, telling him that she is sorry for giving the piece to Yugi, but thinks it was the right choice. But with their bond, Diva is just happy that she isn't harmed. Yugi ends up telling Kaiba that he should be the one to duel Diva, going after him for what he did to Yugi's friends as Kaiba agrees, giving him the new duel disc as their duel begins. Here, Diva claims to only be doing this in the efforts of getting to the other dimension and no longer wanted to be a part of the current cruel world. As he looks back at his younger years as he was living in an abusive environment with a man who would force all of the children to steal for him as he would treat them poorly. Shadi would then show up and take down the man, tapping Diva's forehead where a symbol appears for a moment and doing this to all the other children before finishing off the man with the quantum cube. As the battle continues, Yugi ends up defeating Diva as he then disappears for now, while Bakura is brought back from the dimension that he was in as Kaiba gets ready to duel Yugi for the two pieces of the puzzle so he can bring back the other Yugi, in his words, as Kaiba now places the puzzle in the middle of the arena, with Yugi trying to tell Kaiba that Atem is gone, and proves this by placing the last two pieces in it with nothing happening. But what does happen is Diva went back to where the Millennium Ring was left as its energy takes over him. Back at the arena, Kaiba refuses to believe that what Yugi is saying is true, and forces the duel to continue until the power goes out, stopping the duel from happening as Diva, or Dark Diva, arrives back to them as Yugi and Kaiba have to do the classic team up once again. The duel has turned into a shadow game, naturally, where body parts fade away depending on life points being lost. Dark Diva ends up putting them both in a pretty bad position and is ready to defeat Yugi for good, but Kaiba pulls a good guy move here, getting the attack to come to him instead as he hands Yugi the Millennium Puzzle back, telling Yugi to call him now as he disappears. Yugi puts on the puzzle, but still tries to take on the battle, thinking calling out through the puzzle would be hopeless, as then a beam of light zaps a transformation and sees the return of Pharaoh Atem as he is now taken over the duel from here, defeating Diva as he calms back down before disappearing. Yugi and Atem share a moment together as the Pharaoh heads back home, acknowledging the help when things have felt hopeless. Atem touches the puzzle, sending himself and the puzzle away, as Kaiba then gives Yugi some actual respect, claiming him to be a competent duelist as Yugi appreciates Kaiba's words with them going their separate ways for now. Diva ends up in the Plano Realm as he sees the others along with him no longer having his special powers, but he is at peace. As the movie comes to a close, Yugi ends up giving a graduation speech at school and our characters have grown up a bit and now all go on their separate ways to their dreams. Back with Kaiba, he is in the space station once more as he leaves Mokuba in charge for now, as Kaiba has found a way to enter the afterlife in search of Atem's palace, getting there and meeting him in the throne room, activating his duel disc and being ready for a real duel, as Atem stands up from his throne, offering a smile with the film ending. The film is a lot of fun and while it does bring the Pharaoh back, it does so in a way that doesn't disrespect the ending of the series, making it quick and momentarily rather than having him around the whole film. It also gave us a deeper look into the lore of the show and tried to connect together some other plots or explanations. It's also pretty long. Bonds Beyond Time was only around like an hour, feeling like a special more than anything, as the dark side of Dimension is two hours and 20 minutes long. So it's packed with a lot of fun moments. Before we get to the end here, I just want to spend a moment to give a thank you and pay my respects to the creator of the series, Kazuki Takahashi. Not only did he create a series that has done nothing but continue to expand in many new ways that built an amazing and massive community 
community that cherishes all things that are Yu-Gi-Oh, but he was also a great person. Sadly, in July of 2022, Takahashi ended up passing away while trying to save some people off the coast of Okinawa, who were caught in the rough waters during some bad weather. He went out as a hero, and I am thankful for his contributions to the world that helped change my life as a kid growing up, getting to befriend so many others in the community, and become a lifelong fan of the franchise across nearly every aspect. You were an inspiration to many, you brought millions of people together, and your legacy and name hold genuine weight forever. Thank you for everything, and may you rest easy, Mr. Takahashi. I want to also thank you all for watching this video as well as the series in general if you've watched every part so far. Yu-Gi-Oh! has always and will always be a part of my life and means something to me, and I would love to hear what it means to you, so feel free to share in the comments below what Yu-Gi-Oh! truly means to you in your life. I've been Jordan Fringe, thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe, later.